Okay, if I could have everybody take their seats, please, we will get started. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Greg Smogard. I'm Innovation and Business Development Officer here at the University of South Florida Sarasota Manatee Campus. I want to be the first of a few folks to welcome you here to our beautiful campus. And uh, we have uh, aligned a great list of speakers today. I think you'll find it, and hopefully you'll find it <clears throat> very informative as well as in true university fashion, very thought uh, stimulating as well. So again, thank you for spending some time with us. Um, I'm going to do a couple of uh, housekeeping logistics issues, and I'm going to turn it over to a few folks who are going to do a more of a formal welcome. So first of all, you should all have uh, on your seats a brochure. If you don't, uh, there are some extras out there. Paul standing at the door back there has some extras, so if you'd like to raise your hand if you didn't get one. Inside, you'll find an agenda, <clears throat> some detailed bios and all the speakers and moderators. Uh, we also have uh, uh, another event coming up, which is the Financial Markets and Economy Financial Literacy Day, April 11th, which is some information here as well. And I also want to uh, take this opportunity to thank the sponsors for today's event. Yeah, they're on the back of your brochure, and they're also on the screen above. But I want to highlight Cumberland Advisors, the Global Interdependence Center, uh, Science and Environmental Council, and the Atlas Insurance. If we give them a big hand, we'd appreciate that. In addition to sponsoring the event, they have also been very, very uh, good in terms of uh, uh, gathering speakers for us, so we want to thank them for that as well. Now, on to the logistics. For those of you who haven't been here before, uh, hopefully you have a chance to walk around a little bit. Coffee, beverages, restrooms are in the hallway. And there's also a table back there where we have a lot of information on our campus. So please feel free to pick up some information and share it with family and friends. And that table's right over there. Lunch, we'll break for lunch. And uh, in true fashion to the theme of today, we did adapt a little bit to a slight weather change. It's a little cooler than we anticipated. So what we're going to do is we're going to put everything out on the uh, patio, but we are going to have the food on the patio, but we also have two other locations. So you can either move across to the cafe, which we've opened up, and we also have set up some tables in the rotunda. So you have three choices for lunch in terms of where you'd like to eat. So we provide a lot of uh, good food, and hopefully you'll have a chance to network and do your phone calls and whatever else you need to do during uh, lunch break. So, But there'll be three locations, and we have student ambassadors. Those are the students out front that have the green blazers. We have a lot of uh, faculty and staff that are here to help, so if you need any directions, please feel free to reach out to us, and we will be more than happy to guide you there. Um, for the speakers and panelists, this is Marty standing behind me, and if you would, about 10 minutes before your presentation, chat with Marty. He will hook up your mic and make sure that it's tested and ready to go so we can keep on, on schedule. One slight adjustment to the agenda. Our, uh, at the last minute, our 215 presenter could not come. Uh, so what we've done in the afternoon is we're going to allow uh, some additional minutes for the speakers, which in some ways is probably good because we had a conference call with the speakers and they have a lot of very good information and we thought we may not have enough time for them, and in this case, it's allowed us to provide them a little additional time. So, uh, but we should finish pretty much on schedule, to let you know that. Um, as far as opening remarks, I'm gonna let most of the other folks who follow me talk to you about that, but the theme again of today is adapting to climate change. So what we put the program together, we wanted to focus on more of a, morning is gonna be more of a macro global view of it, and then in the afternoon, we're going to focus and zero in on more of a, the, the local impact. So you'll see that, and you're going to hear more and more about that when we talk about the, uh, the uh, speakers as they come forward. And I can tell you that it's a very hot topic, of course. There, uh, we, I've spent the last two weeks at three different economic briefings, regional economic briefings, and one of the indicators that kept coming up in all of the three economic briefings was the importance of climate change, both on the economy as well as other factors that uh, will uh, impact the, uh, the region as well as the economy. So uh, it is something that everyone is talking about. With that, I'm going to make the first introduction. And uh, I am delighted to be able to present to you uh, our regional chancellor, Dr. Karen Holbrook. I had a chance to, I'm pretty new, she's pretty new actually. We both uh, started at the uh, beginning, she started at the beginning of last year, I joined in the middle of last year. And uh, I've had the pleasure of working with her on a daily basis and uh, I can tell you that I have been totally impressed with her vision 
and her leadership and her experience. And again, I'm not going to go into the bios because they're in the in the brochure, but I did want to tell you that uh, her experience was especially impressive, uh, being president of The Ohio State as well as the interim president of Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Those are very prestigious universities as well, and we're delighted to have her on our campus as our leader, and so it gives me a great deal of pleasure to uh, present our regional chancellor, Dr. Karen Holbrook. Thank you, Greg, very much, and welcome to all of you. We are so, so pleased that you are here at the University of South Florida, Sarasota Manatee. How many of you have never been to this campus? Terrific, terrific. Now you're here. So you'll get to see what we do, and you'll get to see where our students eat, where our students work, and we want you to come back many times. We try to have interesting programs for the community, and this is one of them that we are really very excited about, and we're excited to do this with our partners, and you've already seen who our partners are, but our, one of our main partners is the Global Interdependence Center, thanks to David Kotak of getting us connected with that. Some of you know that we put on a very good symposium, I think, on Cuba and the Caribbean after the problems that we had in Puerto Rico, and it was a very exciting symposium, and then this is going to be the third time that we have had what's so-called a financial literacy day. That's kind of a misnomer because it's really going to be about the economy and the economic markets and the economy. So that's another one that usually fills up completely. And then we have an Institute of Public Policy and Leadership, and we have a number of programs through that institute that hit a number of topics that are important to the entire community. So those of you who are new, please come back. Those of you who are, have been here, please stay with us because you're going to see a lot of very exciting changes on this campus. Hopefully in the near future, but it takes time to get things done. Our goal is to have a new residence hall so that we will attract students that come from farther than just our community. We love our community students, but we really need a bigger population, and there's a lot of interesting programs here that are only going to get stronger as we consolidate with the whole University of South Florida system. And then our next goal, and we're going to start plugging this really, really aggressively soon is right down there is to build the ISTIC, the Integrated Science and Technology Center, so that we can bring a lot more jobs in these areas to our community in high tech, in 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 in, in in information technology and in the humanities as it blends with those programs because as you know and you're going to hear today again the getting the humanities and getting the social sciences combined with the sciences is the way we simply have to go because any of the problems that we are working on as we're talking about today are global problems and they are local problems and they require all kinds of different disciplines that feed into them so you do not just look at climate change from the perspective of what's happening in science but it's what's happening in the economy, what's happening in the markets, what's happening in preparing our students. And as Dr. Smogart has said, both of us have been to the same meetings in this community looking at what's happening in terms of predicting the future and what are the and the one thing that comes up is, as Greg has just said, is climate change. But I'm going to drill down a little bit more. It's red tide. And red tide is what's all in the, in, the, in the papers here. It's in the papers everywhere, but focusing very much here. So that's one of the aspects that is going to be presented today. And you will hear a lot about that. But I think what's great about this symposium is Bob's vision for it, which is a little bit different than simply saying this is one to look at what the science is behind climate change. This is looking at how it impacts and what, the, what climate change is doing to populations, to communities, to regions, and specifically will drill down greatly into uh, our own region here. So I am very, very excited that we have been able to put this on. I have to say it started out with Dave Kotox, David Kotak's vision that this is something we should do. And we started out thinking, well, climate change, what's new? And then we got Bob Bunting involved, and we figured out what's new and how it can be very exciting and how it can be different. And then we've gotten many other people to think about it, and these are the people who you're going to hear from today. So I am very excited about the kind of program that we, has been put together, and I hope you will find it as intriguing as those of us who've been involved in it have. If you've seen Bob's video, you'll have a 
precis of what it's going to look like today, but I, I wish you a very, very productive day. I hope there are wonderful questions, and I hope you all go away having learned something, but also having contributed and having taken and taking it back to your communities and talking about it more and more. So with that, I've probably said more than I needed to, but let me introduce David Kotak, who has really been so important to this year university and so many things that we're doing. David is one of the founders of Cumberland Advisors and a major person in Global Interdependence Center and he's the chief investment officer for Cumberland Advisors and a good friend of the University of South Florida, Sarasota Manatee. A good friend of Karen Hover. Well, thank you, David. <laughs> we're so glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. It's, um, it's been a pleasure to work with Karen and we have NR pioneering lots of stuff between the Global Interdependent Center and this university. And 10 years ago, when Christine and I moved to Sarasota, the Global Interdependent Center, which has done programs throughout the world for half a century, had one member in Sarasota. And I can't even remember who it was. That has now changed. So uh, let me housekeep for three or four minutes. Many here don't know what the Global Interdependent Center is. It is a neutral convener of dialogue r around the world on topics and issues, some of them, like this one, controversial. And it has programs all over the world. And we have created relationships with central banks and universities throughout the world, and USF Sarasota Manatee is now one of those university partners. And that has been a developing thing, thanks to Karen and the support of the university for now a couple of years, and we have more to do. So on April 11th, there's a flyer on the table, and I just want to reinforce Karen's uh, message. The keynote speaker is Gretchen Morganson. For those of you who know her, she wrote the front page Sunday business section column affair game in the New York Times and is now with the investigative reporting unit at the Wall Street Journal. And she will be here with a lot of information about the stock market and about global economics and trade and all that stuff on April 11th, but there's a very special piece that ties to this in a way today. There will be a panel on health, hunger, and philanthropy. And the speakers include Dr. Judy Monroe, who is the CEO of the Center for Disease Control Foundation, Lisa Ryerson, who is the CEO of the AARP Foundation. Those two organizations deal with health and hunger. And Aaron McLeod, who is the CEO of the Friendship Center in five places on the west coast of Florida, including Sarasota. And that discussion will take place about the role of philanthropy in those issues. You are all welcome. It's open to the public. The Global Interdependence Center and my firm and partners, Cumberland, sponsor it and we're partnered with the university. Everybody here is invited, and we expect the room to be about as full as you see it now and maybe more. So I would advise if you wish to come on April 11th, don't dawdle unless you want to stand on the side. There's another GIC event. We don't have a flyer here, but it's on February 1st. That's next Friday. Bill Strauss is delivering a speech on the U.S. manufacturing center uh, uh, sector, and that's at the Yacht Club in the morning. And for all information on the Global Interdependence Center events, I want to recognize two people. Jill Fernito, our executive directrice. We, we go to Paris about once every other year, so I practice that. And if anyone's interested, they can see Jill. Members are welcome. Uh, she can give you information about the GIC. And you're all welcome if you're interested. And at Cumberland, our contact 
person, program, evolution, development with our community relations is Sharon Brazant. Sharon can also give you information about February 1st or April 11th, and you'll be able to recognize Sharon at any time because she has hair different than I do. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one last thing, and I'll get out of the way. Um, from time to time, I write something. The last piece in a single issue was uh, uh, put out about 10 days ago, and it was the latest update on the Zika virus, and it was triggered by conversation with Bob Bunting and then reports which came out which described what is happening as climate change changes temperature zones and mosquitoes find themselves in different places. So that triggered I've written about Zika a number of times. So I decided to put it together in a pamphlet. This is my second pamphlet. It's here, all the documentation is here, it's free, and it's sitting on a table, you're welcome to take it with you, and if we run out of them and you see uh, Sharon or me and give me a business card and say, yeah, I need a Zika pamphlet and some mosquito flew away with the old one, I'll be happy to, happy to get another one for you, but you're welcome to it. The bottom line today, according to a conversation I had with Judy Monroe recently, there still is no vaccine, and the virus does mutate, and climate change, which we won't have much on in insects today, I, but there's some, climate change is changing the trajectory of mosquito-borne disease. Lastly, am I supposed to say something about you? That's Bob Bunting. His bio is here. He has a distinguished, distinguished career. He's a good friend, and we visited together many times now. And the driving force to put together this program, I think, and the credit for it goes to Bob Bunting. You are introduced. It's your microphone, Bob, please. Well, good morning. Um, this is really a, a big day uh, from my perspective. Um, in a way, it's a dream come true. I didn't even realize what the dream was for a long, long time because uh, it was about putting a puzzle together. And um, I want you to think about putting a puzzle together today because when we're done, I'm hoping that you will agree with me that putting the puzzle together is the first and most important thing before you can adapt to anything or mitigate anything. And quite frankly, for 30, 40 years, we haven't done that very well. And that's why uh, the global climate condition has not been really fully embraced. And we are still waiting for someone else to do it. And so the only way that we can move forward, in my opinion, is not to look to government as in the essence of global government or national government. Because what we have to remember is that public opinion drives government, not the other way around. And until we know what we want to do and how we want to do it, we're going to have this incredible debate that continues to go on. That's not a, an even debate. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It does to me, and it does to Bob Carell. It doesn't matter why the climate's warming and what the other impacts are, the secondary impacts. At the end of the day, what we have to admit is the climate is changing. And because it's changing, our lives are changing. It's not a debate about who's responsible, but that's the way it's been presented. And until we can move from threat to opportunity, the human condition isn't going to allow us to move forward. So going from global to local is really what the theme of this is, because every day we're being impacted by climate change. 
And the rate at which that is happening is uh, significant, significantly more than a background climate change would be. And so with that sort of background, what we have to understand is before people can move, we all have to agree what the picture is. Someone said a picture's worth a thousand words. So the first part of this is putting the picture together in a way that people get it. I know that sounds weird, but that's really what we're doing. It's a situational awareness of where we are right now. How can we move to a different place if we don't know where we are? So one thing I want to say quickly is that Steve Jobs decided that we had calendars, emails, telephones, um, reminders, appointments, and all of these various things that we all had in separate places. They were all on the table. They were pieces. And one day he said, we're going to reinvent the phone. The phone is still the phone. But everything else that we care about in our lives, a lot of it, is organized in the iPhone. He didn't invent the calendar. He just rearranged the pieces. And that was his brilliance. And the pieces of the puzzle is what he put together. And when he did that, he created the greatest company in the history of the world. It's hard to believe that, but that's what happened. So in our situation, we have all the pieces on the table. Florida, in particular, is an amazing place. Did you know that if Florida was a country, it would be the 17th largest economy in the world out of 150 countries? 17th largest. Why are we waiting to do something? It's incredible that we have six institutions of higher learning that have advanced degree granting programs in the atmospheric and related sciences. We have 12 universities that have marine science and marine biology programs in Florida. We have NOAA centers that are talked about all over the world every day, including the National Hurricane Center. We have the greatest group of climate and weather scientists that live in any place in Florida. We have a $90 billion a year tourist industry that really is being impacted by climate change. We have an incredible amount of wealth in Florida, just on the shoreline in Florida, which by the way is the longest shoreline in the United States except for Alaska. $7 trillion worth of real estate on the beach. We have so much asset here. Why isn't Florida leading the show on climate adaption and mitigation? I think the reason is nobody's put the picture together in a way that people get it. It's not about the science. It's there. It exists in silos all around. It's not about public policy expertise. It's not about the government's will to deal with the threats to the population. It's about the integration of all of these things into a common situation analysis that can spur adoption, adaptation, and mitigation. So that's the, the, the flow of this conference, and that's why it's different from probably anything you've gone to. We're going to start this morning with talking about the global climate condition. And then we're going to move on to how the secondary impacts are in fact in affecting Florida from hurricanes to red tides. And um, we're going to have scientists and engineers of note here this morning 
uh, talking about that. And the, then this afternoon it goes down to how are government entities and private enterprise dealing with this? And how can this threat actually be one of the greatest economic opportunities we've ever seen? My prediction is that in Florida in the next 50 years, the biggest growth industry will be climate adaptation and mitigation. And that's going to spur an, an environmental um, upgrade, uh, an entrepreneurial burst of energy, and it's going to create many, many jobs in Florida. Just to give you a quick background, PGT Windows in our area is responding to hurricanes. In the last seven or eight years, that company now employs 3,000 people right here. And they're making impact hurricane windows. And I spent about 60 grand on those for my house. <laughs> I'll probably be the poster boy for BGT. I don't know. So what I'm saying is that, yes, hurricanes are a threat. We have 3,000 people working here mitigating that threat for people with some of the greatest products in the world. And last year, $800 million in sales, growing 20% a year. I don't know, I own that stock. Uh, so um, before we, I introduce the first speaker, I do want to say briefly, we have a couple of people who have come from far and near that I want to introduce. The first one is <clears throat> Helge Lovdal. Is Hel Helge here? There he is. He's from Norway. Helge is a... Um, for 35 years, he, he uh, was in the Confederation for Norwegian Businesses and Industry as a prime consultant. And then he moved on, and, and by the way, it's a think tank, uh, and it, it looks at future conditions, including climate change. And then he moved on to the Norwegian State Development Fund. And if I can quote him, he says, I've been occupied with the serious challenge of, changing, of a changing shoreline, which in Norway is not sufficiently on the public agenda. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> also, I would like to recognize, um, if I can find my notes here, Ted Brown. Ted is the founder of the uh, Beckman Institute. And uh, I, don't, I just don't want to introduce him as the founder of the Beckman Institute, which is doing some great work in climate change. But Ted is 90 years old, and he managed to make it here today. Thank you so much, Ted. All right, with that background, we're going to start with global. And I can think of no better person than um, Dr. Robert Carell, Bob Carell. Bob is a, he's a renaissance man. He's a, an engineer. Uh, he's a global climate scientist, and he's an oceanographer of note. Talk about Bob uh, and I met when he was the deputy director of the geosciences division of the National Science Foundation. Um, the National Science Foundation funds the National Center for Atmospheric Research, where I worked for many years. And so uh, that's how we met. And we've been fast friends for 40 years now. So without further introduction, here is Bob Carell. I need a clicker. Good morning. I thought I'd begin this story with this gentleman who's literally before an iceberg field and a, and a uh, glacier that's calving uh, on a little iceberg himself. Uh, 24 hours ago, I was there. I've just flown in from there to join you. 
It is my pleasure. All right, I gotta get my head. How about that? How many pianos have done that before? <laughs> all right. All right, let me. Uh, all right, I'm not sure I know how to do this. There we go. I'd like to chat with you this morning about first what it is we know about this thing called our global environmental system within which weather, climate, ecosystems all evolve so that we, we can be as happy as we are here in Florida. And <clears throat> I want to go in the morning from this global scale down to Florida and talk more about one of the big challenges, this rising sea. So it's a conversation. If you raise a hand, I will stop. Um, if you're tr troubled by what I've said, I want to hear it, because we're here to have a conversation, uh, not, a, not a lecture. So there are opportunities and challenge, and we'll talk later this morning, uh, how do we frame that in ways in which we can come together and put uh, Bob Bunting's quiz, uh, puzzle together. So let's explore this. <clears throat> we know some things over a long time. This is 800,000 years. And uh, during that time, they have all these cycles, you've heard about them, times when we've had <coughs> um, ice ages, and then we have what we call the between ice age or other ways of describing it. But we've never had anything more than about 200, about 300 parts per million. Now, in this leg legacy, this is like the GDP of climate change, parts per million. It tells us a measure of what's going on in the system. And we're now up to around 414 parts per million, and we're putting, well, last year, we put five parts per million into that system. So things are changing pretty rapidly. Uh, and uh, I'd like to go back to the previous time when we had about 280 parts per million, when Mother Nature was driving the system. We were not there to do the things that caused it to happen. And as I said, we're there. And when you begin to look at this, now down at 400,000 years, you find that things like the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, global temperature, sea level, they're all kind of coupled. They're kind of coupled in a kind of wiggly way because there are lots of different frequencies that are controlling them, but there's no doubt that we have this pattern of change. And we have nice names like the last time this interglacial period occurred, we called it the Immian. But now we call it the Holocene. Those of you who are, recall from your geology, that's kind of the way we describe things. Um, <clears throat> but we invented what we are doing now. We call it the Anthropocene. This is a geological world, meaning anthro, meaning people, who are now a part of the system in a ways that you'll see we are changing. So those are the two kind of things we want to talk about. Uh, and how is it? that Mother Nature has, in her massiveness, taken all this to go. To get all these wiggles, there's one dominant feature. As we go around the sun once a year, over 100,000 years, we get farther away, and then we get closer. And when you're farther away, temperatures go down. And when the temperatures go down, we get ice, massive ice. So when we're pretty close to this orbit right now, we're a circular, but in fact, we are moving away. So we should be moving into an ice age, but we're not. And that is, for reasons that we'll try to share with you, uh, there, there are behaviors in the system of which we're a part. I do one thing that uh, take interesting people who are in positions of power and go to Greenland, we kind of live it. And we'll do this again in April. First thing we do is we get in seal skins, we meet a team of dogs, and about 20 of us go live off the land. Presidents of companies like BMW and Dahmer Aircraft and, and uh, <coughs> Siemens have all been with us. And what happens in every one of those trips? At the end of the day, they say, you know, it never occurred to me. I'm just, I'm just like a tree. I'm like the snow. I'm like an animal. I'm a part of the system. And we've now got 7.7 .7 billion of us and that makes a difference from what it was even less 
than a thousand years ago. So that's what drives the system. So we get cold air, hot air. All right. Now, if we just go back over this period in which human time brought us to where we are today, 10,000 years, we went up and now we wiggle like this. Very little change has occurred. And during the first part of that, the amount of CO2 that went into the atmosphere from a natural system was very small, 0 0.002. Remember, that's kind of the GDP of the business. But now it's two to three. In fact, it was five last year. So we've gone into this change. It's got this rapid thing accelerating on how the planet is behaving. So this 10,000 years, uh, which we call the Holocene, at the very beginning of it, st stabilized so that it doesn't change very much. In fact, it changed less than 7 tenths of a degree centigrade for 10,000 years. So human time, you and me, we were able to invent everything from agriculture to cities, the way in which we live. Cro-Magnon were living in southern France 10,000 years ago. So that evolution is, of humankind has occurred in this changing environment, uh, but with great stability. All right, a thousand-fold increase. How do we get there? How do we know all this stuff? Well, we drill holes in the ice. And when we do, you find in the ice little tiny spheres hollow that froze at the time when they were capturing the atmosphere. And it's like a little library book. We have the capacity. Mother Nature says, I'm doing all this stuff. Your job is to figure it all out. That's what science is all about. And fundamentally, that's what knowledge about what drives us as human beings is really all about. So that's an ice core. But look at the stuff we can learn about. I should back up. Let you, that, that's all inside that little sphere. Then you say, well, how do you know the temperature? Well, it turns out the two isotopes of oxygen measure it exactly. Do it in a tenth of a degree centigrade. So we can measure those, and we can get the temperature. All of these ions, the thing that's really remarkable is we now can get the DNA. And we can bow, begin to think what's happened in certain parts of the biological system over this last 800,000 years when we have all these things. Now, I want to show you a bit what's been going on. We have a population that has grown since 1750, when we only had less than a billion people. 1750, not long ago. I actually have named grandparents. They're called great-great-great-grandparents. I'm a Swede who came, my grandparents all came here from Sweden, but that's less than a billion. So multiply that by 10. That's almost where we are today, 7.7 .7 billion people. So that's kind of what's been going on. And I want to show you a little movie that takes you from 1750, but look at the number two. Let's forget about what the number is. How does it change? We're going to watch it in a little film that starts with 1750. We'll watch the emissions, and here we go. Where did it all begin? It began in England with the discovery that we could take coal and we could make energy out of it. We could build a future of humankind in a way that had never been thought of before. We can convert that energy into machinery to do the things that enable us to be in this room tonight. But look what's happening. Europe's lighting up. These are the emissions of carbon dioxide. The US lights up. That's this, look, you pick up some things in the Far East. We're now down when I was born. You could write a history book by looking at where that happened and why did it happen there. It was the evolution of us people bringing together our intellectual capacities to make a better world. It's now starting at 2, and it's now 10,000. So, you know, we call that 
two orders of magnitude, three, uh, four orders of magnitude, a factor of times 10, four times. And in that time, we now have 7.7 uh, .7 billion people as of the 1st of January of this year. So the interesting thing is we all exhale CO2. And when we do, it goes in the atmosphere. And that's a part of the living system. And then we have plants that convert it back into oxygen for us. But the incredible thing is that breath will be distributed on the planet within a year. So it, it rapidly restructures itself and moves it about. So we don't have to measure this stuff in 10,000 places. We can measure it in a, in a few places. In fact, we measure it in a few tens of places very, very accurately. So where does it go? And where did it come from? Well, most of it comes from burning those wonderful fossil fuels that enabled us to have the energy. And if you ask yourself, is there anything in this room that did not come from energy being enabling it, from the building materials to the lighting in the room to the light bulbs that drive that? So that's good stuff. But about 12% of it ends up in, the, in where? If you want to think simply about it, half of it goes in the atmosphere, a quarter of it goes back into the trees and the plants to convert it back into oxygen, and about a quarter of it ends up in the ocean. And we'll talk about that as a sidebar, but let me just hit it softly. CO2 sitting on the ocean, if it gets bigger, it picks up more of that CO2, dissolves it. It's like a Coke bottle. Those bubbles are all CO2, and they're, they're acidic, and it changes the ocean. And when we talk about the tides and some of this, we'll later today see that that's not a good deal. All right. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this is the carbon cycle. Where did it come from? Where does it go? How much of it goes around and such? But those are the kinds of things that our students in all our universities are coming to know as a kind of a, the Bible about how this whole system works is where did it come from and where did it go? And how does this greenhouse effect work? I think I put it in real simple terms. We walk outside, we can see the energy. It's called light. When that light hits the ground, hits the snow, hits anything down here, it convert, converts it into the infrared. can't see it, but you can feel it. If you touch a black, black um, driveway, it's hot. That's because that is emitting this energy, but I can't feel it like I can see. And that's the fundamental piece that drives the, the system. That energy can come through as light, but can't get out as infrared. And it gets caught like a blanket over top of our planet. And so if we put more of it, the blanket gets thicker, contains more of it. So we'll talk about that without spending too much time on it. Now, some people say, how do you really know this? It's really not very complicated, but a little bit scientific. <laughs> if, if the lower part of the atmosphere where we live gets warmer, which it is, uh, if that energy coming in got right back out, then the, tro the stratosphere way, way up there would also be warming. It's cooling because the energy coming in is trapped and less of it getting out. So this is the fingerprint on climate change and, and mostly the greenhouse effect. It sounds a little complicated, but the fact of the matter, if the stratosphere cools, the climate system is working because infra, uh, greenhouse gases are doing their thing. This is kind of let you look what's been going on. Time scale up there, blue is cooler, and now it's getting warmer. This is, I was born in 34. Kind of didn't change very much prior to that. But now it's really moving. Look what's going on just in the last few decades. 
There it is. Now you notice the, the Arctic is warmer than the Antarctic. Why is that? Kind of simple. There are 10,000, there are 10 times as much ice down there. So if you have a drink tonight and put one ice cube in, that's the Arctic. If you put 10 ice cubes in it, that's the Antarctic. So the Antarctic is going to be dragging back about a generation or two from the rest of us. So the temperature has been increased about a, a degree centigrade, which is 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you want to do the numbers, it's twice. Simple, OK? The Arctic gets warmer faster and about two to three times as big. That's a toughie. This is some of the data for you. But the global and, uh, and the, and the uh, Arctic are roughly out of phase by a factor of two to three. And the winter is doing it even faster. I went to a place in Russia where they get 70 degrees centigrade below zero. That is really cold. They don't do that. It only gets down to about 30 degrees below. And that's, that's roughly <coughs> about 30 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. OK, enough of that. What does it look like if we start projecting this future? All right, here we go. This is what it looks like in 19, uh, 2050. This is done by our US Academy of Sciences. Trying to project this, we have all kinds of models and we run them and we run them and we calibrate each other and, eat, and then we take a, a mean value of them and that gives you the fact that it's gonna be that, that planet member for 10,000 years has not had its global average temperature raised more than 7 tenths of a degree. So we're talking about 10 times as much. If we wait to 2100, it's going to be warm. Any way you clock it. And we'll talk a little about that later. But we're talking about 11 degrees centigrade, which is roughly 10 times what we have had for 10,000 years. So that's a, not a good deal. Not a good deal. Uh, so just to remind you that it does get pretty warm up here. Enough of that. Let's talk about us here in this lovely part of the world, uh, Florida. Uh, but that little picture up there, I, I love it because that's Mother Nature and us. That little dot is blue. It was not played with by Photoshop or anything. The blue planet, that's us. And that's a picture of her uh, from Cassini back in 2006. And I asked my students, how long did it take for that signal to get here? Think about it. You're, you're 800 million miles away at 270,000 miles a second. It actually actually doesn't take very long. It takes a, 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 little, a little over a few minutes. OK, let's talk about sea level. That's, that's where we go when we do to go to Greenland. That's an iceberg. That peak is about 120 meters. Remember, 7 to 1, that means there's seven times lower. So if it's 120 meters above, and let's say an average out of, say, 100 meters, that means there's 700 meters of ice down. And we're in water that's 1,500 meters long. That's one of our research vessels. So what's happening with this baby? We call it the cryosphere, the, the cold sphere. And that governs a whole bunch of things from snow and how water moves around and where the ice is and how permafrost behaves. And then that ice sheet stuff uh, in Greenland and in Antarctica, which in the next couple of minutes, you'll see how, how big a deal that is. So the ice sheets that we're worried about are Greenland and Antarctica. The ice caps and things, but when ice melts in the sea, it doesn't change it. Remember when you put your ice, ice in your drink, the water level didn't change just because it melted. So when you hear about melting ice in the Arctic Ocean, an undo thing to sea level just went from, from ice to water. But the reflective character, when it was ice and snow, 85% of the energy that came in went back out. When it became water, 85% of the energy was absorbed, and we'll talk a teeny bit about that in a minute. So here's that same record that you saw in another way. 
a lot of wiggles, um, but 400 feet difference. 400 feet. So when we take water, evaporate it, and shift it up into Antarctica or, or, the, or the Arctic into ice, water goes down. So when we were in these valleys, the water was uh, roughly 400 feet below. I hope I got the right slides here. And so this tells you these things don't move slowly. They have, we have these pulses, and what are they? Huge hunks of ice have broken off in Antarctica. So it goes on, bing, and it might change the global sea level by two to three meters in a few months. All right, enough. So it was uh, about 400 feet uh, less water than we have today, only 20,000 years ago. All right. 120,000 years ago, that's what we were. So that's when we were one of these peaks, and all, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, why is that backward? Yeah, no, we're at the Eemian. This is when we melted everything, and the water came up, and the sea level rose, and when it did so, that was Florida. All right? <coughs> But when we have all the ice up there, that would be Florida. I try to keep where we are. I'm sorry if you're not a Tampa Bay person. I should have put uh, uh, our good place, uh, Sarasota. But that's what it was. Just that, that green on the right, now that's under water, is the West Continental Shelf right. of Florida. Yeah. And, and these continental shelves have been, cr have been crafted by the fact that when it, we've been 800, by the way, those 800,000 years have been repeating on the planet for probably 25 million years. So we've carved out the planet and we've got deeper water, as he just aptly pointed out, because those were the conditions in which we've faced for many, many years. All right, that's what we are today. Not a big difference, huh? But to go from that panel to that one, or from that one and that, is what we're going to talk about today, because that's what sea level rise is all about. 400 feet, here's only a few tens of feet different. People ask, is it Iceland, is Greenland, and they're melting. This is the amount of ice. We have beautiful satellites that enable us to tell exactly how much mass of ice there is. Uh, and Greenland itself, is now providing about 30 to 40% of all sea level rise. So it's one we need to watch. That's why I take groups up there. All right. Here's the projections. These are NOAA. Bob was there many years ago. Um, it's one of the more conservative, but it says uh, the likelihood of the mean value, it's going to be a, a meter or so if everything goes smoothly. However, if we get one of these breakoffs in Antarctica, it'll easily bounce to the top line or, or about. And I want to say a word uh, about that in a second. So if it's me and talking to people, worry about a couple, two to three meters of sea level in the projected future. Some of it will come earlier or later. The one thing we can tell for sure is it will get two or three meters of sea level. The trouble is we're not smart enough to say when. So we usually say, well, when's it going to be in 2100? That's tough. Then we get this conservatism, but we know we'll have two to three meters of sea level of the order within 100 years, plus or minus probably 50. That's where we are. Now, big differences. These are the, the, what I call the lumpiness of the sea. It's not flat. It's lumpy. Look in the Far East, where all those islands are. It's warm all the time. And that sea level, <coughs> excuse me, is markedly different than when the blue is where the sea level is reducing. So the sea level in the red zone is, is very rapidly changing, whereas in the high Arctic, we're not even going to see enough sea level rise to worry about. We'll talk about that in a minute. But it does affect someone. Yes, ma'am. How much of what we saw in that graph could be from El Nino's southern oscillation? 
as a solid oscillation is in the middle of it, it does this. It raises the effect when we're in heaven El Nino. It decreases when we're in the La Nino. But it definitely... Are going to see potentially a shift in that? I was it, there's some evidence that that's likely to be. Good. Now, this is the Netherlands without all the detail. That's one meter of sea level. A group of us, three of us, were invited by Queen Beatrix four, six years ago. She's the queen. And she's, I don't know about this sea level stuff. So for 18 months, we worked with them. And at the very last day, she stood before her people. Remember, she's not the prime minister. She's the queen. And she said, we will plan for three meters of sea level rise by 2100 because we can afford to do it if we do it today. If we wait 10 years, it's dicey. If we wait 20 years, our country go bankrupt. So she said, let's do it. Can you imagine all the industry people at all there worrying about what this is all about? And the queen stood up and did it. A year later, she abdicated. <laughs> I don't think they're related, but a lot of people think it might. Great lady. OK, that's the story. This is a meter in Vietnam. That's a whole, a whole story, and I'll tell it at when we're in the conversation later. But this is kind of where we are, but it happens to be Germany. This area, uh, the Silk Islands, are one of like the Florida West Keys, uh, Western Islands. That's what it looks like. That's what happens with the meter. It's gone. And when you talk to the Germans about it, that's like losing Tampa Bay and this area. So anyways. Those are out of 126 cities on the coast that are going to be affected most rapidly. On the, this is the top list. So we're right there. That's us. By the way, anybody that wants this slide set, talk to Bob. I think it, what, Mark? Marty. Marty. You can have it. And you can, there's yours to use as you see fit. All right. That's the fact. Top four. And we're there. Now I want to say why. There are four things that drive sea level. The first is that when you warm water, the ocean is a bowl. When you warm water, it expands. Simple, not very complicated. Two, and I want to say what happens when we do that. <clears throat> when we warm the water, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but the ocean absorbs 93 plus percent of the excess energy we've been putting into it. So it's storing it. All of the stuff you hear about, the atmosphere and the continent and the glaciers, all of that is in the 7% that's left. That's the stuff that's telling us about it. But the ocean is sitting there <laughs> absorbing that. And finally said, how can that be? I guess one of you ladies got up this morning and took your hair dryer on, right? How long did it take to get hot? Nothing. Did you make a cup of tea? Took three minutes. That's the difference. Air has no capacity to store energy. The ocean stores it. The trouble is that energy is there. And if we were to stop every bit of CO2 into the atmosphere, the ocean would say, oh, I've got this storehouse of energy. We'll just pump it back into the system, and it will warm us another degree or degree and a half. That's not a good deal. All right. So that's what comes from thermal expansion. Uh, then we melt glaciers. Let's go to Greenland. It, only a few years ago, the entire place was melting. That was a unique year. Um, now, only two or three years later, not so much. So Mother Nature does these things of wiggling all over the place. You see weather changes and say, well, you know, it's really cold. How could that be warm? That's because the variability is going to go bigger. So we're going to have colder times and a lot hotter times. But when you average them all out, on, it's going to be warmer. That's what it did last year. And this is what it does. You get these huge melt ponds, 
This happens to look like what's going on on a time scale from the last two years ago. All these melt ponds are connected. They drill holes in the ice. They're called moulins, and they're big, tens of meters across. That hole goes all the way to the bottom, and it's fed by these rivulets of water coming in from all over the melted surface. I spent four months on that ice in, in 1973. I never saw any warm anywhere, no melted ice anywhere. We were on the ice for four months, all over it. I had two, two C-130s that could take us anywhere on the ice we needed because they were both C-equipped. Never saw any of this. So then it runs down, fills these hole, and goes all the bottom. Does two things. It becomes the oil to make it easier for the glacier to slide. And secondly, if it fills that space with no air, it's like a boat. It puts a force upward, like floating that ice. So now the glacier can slide much more rapidly and get rid of its mass and dump it into the sea and raise sea level. After decades of stability, Greenland's Jakobshavn ice stream one of the fastest flowing glaciers in the world has changed we get dramatically. People standing where the bee is. The ice has thinned and the front retreated significantly. Between 1997 and 2003, the glacier's flow rate nearly doubled to five feet an hour. Really moving. I'll give you a little picture of that. What causing the problem in Antarctica is that. Antarctica, a lot of the glaciers come out in what we call a marine glacier, so part of it is into the water. And this is what happens. We get this warm water coming underneath and it's melting the ice from below. And so that thing will just break off. And you've probably read the stories of that happening. It is happening. But so we're getting melting from the top as well as the ocean getting warmer. In this uh, place you just saw in that little movie, the water there is two degrees above zero centigrade, which is unheard of. That's a big deal. All right, so we get an abrupt change. And this just to give you a, a little picture. This is um, one of the places we go. That thing is 70 kilometers long. That's where the ice edge was then in 29. Now look, put simply, that's why I did that twice. Look at how much, 100 years to that, 10 years to move. So things are really happening rapidly. Now this is the face of that glacier. <clears throat> There's a helicopter. That glacier face is a couple hundred meters high and it goes across for many tens of kilometers. And if everything works, that's what you see. Uh, that's been sped up by a factor of 10 just for your comfort. And maybe, maybe, not, maybe not your comfort, huh? <laughs> and, uh, let me do that again. I can't remember. That's about two kilometers wide. So, and when it settles down, it gives you something about 100 meters off the bottom and about 700 meters down. It's a big, big piece of ice. And here, it's the largest effort you've ever seen. I'm going to take it too long. This glacier formation and melting, calving, took 75 minutes. I'm just going to let you see a little bit of it. And it's really upheaving. This incredible transformation occurring of a solid piece of ice being pushed to the sea, enabled by that water underneath to move it rapidly. Watch this. this, watch this thing come up. That's an iceberg. All right, so here's another face doing it. I just want you to see some of the dynamics of what's going on when we get up in the morning and have our breakfast. This is what's happening, in, particularly in the late spring, summer. Is that, Look at, is that floating out here? That, this is all now floating now. That other was not. This happened, this, this is a great story. You, some of you may remember that uh, Senator Ted Stevens was from Alaska and one of his friends died in an airplane accident, another member of Congress.
And that's what it looked like when it happened. So he, made, he got a, a visiting center. Come and see the glacier. And he never went. And that's what it looked like in 2004. And it had gone all the way back. It's around the corner. And Ted was, he went to that center, which is named after him, to see that what he saw when he founded it 25 years earlier had disappeared. He says, how can I tell people to come and see a glacier if there's no glacier? Yeah. All right, enough. Now, there's another process underway. Watch my time here. It's called land subsidence. If you have two miles of ice sitting on the land underneath it, it lowers the bottom. It squeezes it because it's so heavy. Now, if you take the ice away, it's going to come back up. And that, in some places like the Arctic, causes them to have no sea level rise because the subsidence is lifting the bottom up to the point where it counteracts any increase in the, in the uh, meltwater. So that's a non-trivial point. Simple picture, OK, but it creates a bulge. It's like a boat. When you push down and move the boat, a bow wave is up the front. You have a bow wave of this. And when that starts uh, changing, like in the Chesapeake Bay, because the middle of the Chesapeake Bay was the end of the ice age ice, the lower part of the Chesapeake is now lowering. They have, have 1.5 feet of sea level rise in the lower part of the Chesapeake. That's a big deal. In 1900, there were 17 islands in Chesapeake. There are two left. Two left. Tanger and Smith. Uh, enough of that. Um, and then there are local currents. And this is what affects us. There's a massive thing that we're a part of called the Gulf Stream, but it's connected all around the world. It's a study into and of itself. But the Gulf Stream affects us in many ways. It's been heating as it's come all the way across from, from the Pacific, getting warmer and warmer and warmer. And now it's going to head north. And of course, where I was yesterday, they're very happy because that, I was in an ice-free harbor yesterday morning, but some a few, a few tens of miles north is the picture you saw in that little story. But what does this do? If you have a river coming out, of which we have many, the water's going to flow out. If the Gulf Stream is going by, it's going to entrain it, right? Makes sense. As it entrains it, it pulls water out of, of that river. That makes sense, huh? So it's going to pull it along. If the Gulf Stream slows down, it's going to pull less water. And that's what's going from Florida, Maine. Our sea level along this entire coast is rising faster than the global sea level by 50% largely because of this process. So we could just, someone said, well, you're only doing about three millimeters per year. This will cause, in this region, almost 10 times that much. So it's a non-trivial fact. And then there's some major regional differences. But here's a summary. Thermal expansion of the ocean. Again, simple numbers. A third of current sea level rise is from that. Another third is from the Arctic. And most of that is from Greenland. But you've got a bunch of other things. Then you've got some other stuff coring. Now, the numbers are 35, 35, and 30, but that's close enough to a third, third, and third. And in our current case, Antarctica is not contributing anywhere near as much as Greenland or as thermal expansion. And there's some little subtleties, like what happens to the aquifers where our water is stored, that's connected to the ocean. And if that's dynamically changing, which it is, it will have an effect on sea level. All right. So NASA, uh, just last year, um, made clear that uh, things in Antarctica are now heating up. In fact, in the last four decades, it's increased by a factor of, of 280%. So what does this do? Well, first thing 
it's going to do some big things, change weather, hydrologic cycle. Then we're going to have things like Sandy, where three or four things all occurred simultaneously and really played havoc in New York City. Those are all things that are going on. But I want you to see what's happening that causes much of the weather systems, you say. That is a circumpolar jet stream. Now watch what's happening. It's, being, it's going lower and lower. This is real live data from NASA. So there, as it moves further south, what's it going to do? It's going to pull coal down. All right? If it goes further up, it's going to bring lots of warmer air up higher. And this probably is the single most influential issue supporting all kinds of complicated ways in which it changes the weather system on the planet. And it changes the whole behavior. A simple way to looking at it, it's cold, hot. Either the ocean or the atmosphere is going to try to go to where it's colder, right? It's cold, it's very hot down here. It can't go over the top because it's meeting people, stuff from the other side. So it spins all these things into these vertices that we see all over. And you can see how some of the ice just melts in a hurry. And one, one data, there was a 15 degrees centigrade, 26, 27 degrees Fahrenheit difference on either side of the planet due to that, that crazy system I just showed you. All right, this, a quickie here. Oh, I Three things happened. We had this <coughs> hurricane coming from the south, the jet stream moving along, we had a classical nor'easter. They all collided and they didn't move for days. And that's why Sandy was such a terrible thing. We call it simultaneity, and we'll see more of that. Also, we're gonna see hurricanes are stronger, energy-wise. 1970, about 20%. Now, three, four, five hurricanes are gonna go up to 50, 60% of the time. We'll still get the lower ones, but the overall trend and these things are called cyclones in the Far East. Look what happened in 1970 in Bangladesh. Almost half a million people died. In all these cases, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. So this is a non-trivial thing, because what's going to happen is the bottom of the ocean surface, or the top of the ocean surface, is coming up. And when a storm rises on it, it's going to go further inland. Not very complicated. That's something we're going to have to worry about here because hurricanes are present. So the storm surge rising, riding on top of a higher sea will reach much further inland than it did in the past. All right. So these are some of the things. Most importantly, storm surges are going to ride on top of, and the caveat, we really don't know how yet, as I said earlier, to give you a, a sense of what's going on with Antarctica. But I want to give you our problem. There's our problem in a nutshell. We are on an old coral reef. It acts full of holes. Water's going to go into it. So if you put a seawall, nothing happens. Just go underneath and come up on there. That's, that's what happened almost daily down on, on Miami Beach. Whereas Queen Beatrice said, Let's put the wall up and our nation will be okay. That's a fundamental problem. So this is kind of a re-picture of some of that, how this coastline has changed. But this is what it really looks underneath. Lots of stuff going on. But basically, the problem is that as the sea rise, a battle has begun. Rain falls on top of us. That's the recharge of fresh water. And there's always kind of balance, enough of that to keep the sea from coming in and making brackish water beneath us. <coughs> but that, that is being lost. So the water fields that we use almost ubiquitously in South Florida, and even up here, we just drill wells into the aquifer, take the water out and drink it. But in the South Florida, they're already having to close many of the wells that are closest to the coastline 
because they're already brackish water. So county maps show this going on in Fort Lauderdale, uh, all kinds of places on the eastern shore and many places here. So this is kind of what a meter might look like or would look like. The red meaning it's underwater. That's what you see in Miami Beach. And it looks like the water flows through the beach when in fact much of the water is just percolating up in your front yard. Not a nice scene. And that's going to be, that is, will percolate down south. And this is what's going to happen to the Everglades. You've got sea level coming in, percolating from below, as well as because of the lowland rushing in on storms, surface water flowing from the north. Uh, we get recharge. That fight is going to be going on in the news for, for the decades ahead. So this, <laughs> we're going to have to deal with this. Um, and one of the managers said the ocean is no longer an external thing, it's already in our house. And as they try to manage the Everglades, this is a reality. Small island effect, as you know. So in summary, we're going to have um, unprecedented changes in our sea level. Um, and uh, it's likely to have some pretty substantial numbers, like meters. Weather patterns are going to change. These are the two global forces that are going to do. If I might suggest, these are the kind of things we'll do in the, in the seminar later this morning. What are the forces of, to which, Madam, you talk beautifully about the fact this isn't just one thing. There are all kinds of stuff going on, and they affect the very existence of our being here in the room. And those are our opportunity space. And I would argue, as she did eloquently for you, our task is not to sit around and moan, is to get in gear and take advantage of the opportunity it puts before us as we seek to better understand how Florida and its, and its future rides on a number of forces. These are just two of them, the weather and the sea level. With that, I'll end with a picture that was taken and let you do it on Christmas Eve in 1968. And I'll sit down. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We're on the moon watching an Earth rise. I think that's the perfect way to end that because someone said in 1960 that a whole country who had never even thought of it before was going to put a man on the moon in a decade. We're not talking about 2100. And um, in nine years, it happened because we decided to do it. That's the key thing to remember. While there's a huge threat here, obviously, there's a range in the threat. It's not, we're not sure exactly which scenario we're going to get. But I'd like to say this, as a weather forecaster, and a pretty good one, I think, when I say there's an 80% chance for rain, you better bring your umbrella. <laughs> but when I say there's a 10% chance for rain, you probably don't need to. So what we need to think about as these climate forecast is what is the most likely scenario? And it turns out that it's not the catastrophic one that you saw with 6.6 .6 feet of rise. That could happen, but probably what's going to happen is something much less. And because it's less, we don't need to be deer in the headlights. We need to get moving and recreate in, in our lifetime what we were able to do to put men on the moon in nine years. It can be done. And that was 1960, by the way. The rate of change in knowledge in the world, knowledge has doubled since 1990. In the next 20 years, it's going to double again. So when we talk about, well, we can't do anything about it, I think in 50 years, 70 years, we'll be able to suck the carbon out of the atmosphere and not have to worry about turning the lights off. But that's just a prediction. I'm not 80% sure that one. <laughs> anyway, um, so. Uh, are there any questions, a few questions for Bob that he could answer? Yes. Please, please, uh, 
please send this presentation to the White House. <laughs> The irony, it has already been there. Um, there's, what you see in the press and what's happening among our colleagues in the agencies of government, uh, there's a difference. And one of them is that they're, they're concluding very similar things, documents of this character, have been signed off by the heads of agencies. And maybe at the 11 o'clock, we can talk a little more about it. It's, and I don't want to get into the political arena, but we live in a geopolitical world, and that does influence. And I think both you and your chancellor have discussed it, but thank you for making the comment. Do we have one more question? Yes, sir. Wonderful, Wonderful presentation. Um, fascinating. I was born in Bangladesh, by the way, and I was part of those list of catastrophe that you showed. And I just returned from there. I'm a U.S. citizen, uh, got a Ph.D. in energy and environment, working on uh, climate mitigation, global warming mitigation, and so forth. Um, my question is, I mean, you have given an enormous task. What each of us that can do to mitigate this situation, maybe top three things that we, can, we should do and what we should do individually, I think that would be a good message. If we could have the opening slide where the, uh, uh, the with, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I love that slide, as you can I tell. <laughs> no, uh, could you go back to this? I, w I want to just say a word. No, not on my slide set. The one that shows the agenda and their sponsors. What I want to say is that it is through sponsors like you have who are building things like this. Because as Bob said, in the end, we are a democracy and the system will ultimately follow the people. It's hard, it's tough. As one of the great men said, democracy is the worst thing ever invented on the planet, but we ain't done anything better. Because it does work with very difficult. But so conversations, discussions, and then moving into the business world and seeing the opportunity space for, for businesses to, and Bob has one of them. We, are, we really ought to work at how can we pull some of that CO2 back out of the atmosphere. Tough, tough problem. But I think it's, a, it's at our, the other is the whole alternative energy system. As a physicist who told me the other day, he said, Bob, we've only exploited about 10% of what we know in physics to transform energy from one form to another. There's another 90% opportunity space to think of new ways, because we don't, we want to be in this room forever. And we want it to be better all the time, and it'll take energy to do that. So the opportunity space for industry, the recognition that we, the people, need to understand it, become a understanding of it, and the last, and Madam, I would say what you said was a delight for me because underneath this whole thing, our universities will need to transform to address this in a way that they see the opportunity space and they see the opportunity for them to take us into the next, uh, the next century. Um, all of which, all of us gathered here shall applaud your, your prediction. Thank you, Bob. That was... Now you know why I said Bob Carell has to start this. <laughs> Even though Norway's a long way away, and thank you so much for, for, for doing that, Bob. Okay, let's move right on. Okay. Um, my talk is coming up right here. Bob Bunting. The, the Bobs. You know, it's confusing. We do? Oh, we do. Okay. We're going to have a little break first. I'm sorry, Greg. I didn't realize that. So how many minutes? Okay, yes. It's now five minutes to ten. So how about ten ten? We'll start. I'm sorry, I, I felt like we were behind.